There was a man in the second century whose heart was on fire for Christ. And I thought we could meditate on a little bit of his life this morning. It was a man by the name of Polycarp. And he was a pastor in this church in modern day Turkey in the second century who was so on fire for Christ that the Roman government felt threatened by him and effectively went out and seized him from a house outside of the city and dragged him into one of those stadiums that looked a lot like the Colosseum where Christians were martyred and beaten and essentially killed for what they believed. Now Polycarp thanks to the preservation of certain historical documents, was able to utter certain words to that Roman government, to that governor, what they would call a proconsul back in the day, that we can actually read for ourselves this morning. And I want you to hear this morning the story of how this man confronted that situation as he was seized to what will ultimately become his death. Listen to the story of Polycarp. He was seized before the proconsul. And he said to him, Swear by the genius of Caesar. Repent. Say away with the atheists. You see, back in that time, it was Christians who were the atheists. The proconsul urged him and said, Swear, and I will release thee. Curse the Christ. And Polycarp said, Eighty and six years have I served him, and he hath done me no wrong. How then can I blaspheme my king who saved me? But the proconsul again persisted and said, Swear by the genius of Caesar. But Polycarp replied, If thou dost vainly imagine that I would swear by the genius of Caesar, as thou sayest, pretending not to know what I am, hear plainly that I am a Christian. A Christian. That noun, that word, Polycarp understood that it cost something. Don't you agree? It cost him his life. And since the beginning of time, listen, Christians have been insulted, ridiculed, humiliated, even to this day. Ah, you're boring. You're too narrow-minded. You just don't understand what's happening in our culture. Christianity comes at a cost. In fact, listen, (laughs) the moment you say to maybe one of your family members or one of your coworkers the words, I just love Jesus, how do you think they will respond? In some cases, that may mean the end of a relationship. In that moment, it may mean that suddenly you're not as close to as you were once before. And if we're not careful, what could end up happening is in the midst of cultural pressure, we can sort of draw back into the safety or apparent safety of the church walls and into the palace of our minds to the point where we can't even remember the last time we told anybody about Christ. But listen, Jesus didn't design for us to be in this Christian bubble, did he? Jesus didn't design you and I to be passive participants into the kingdom of God. And if you're here and you've been walking with Christ for any time in your life, I bet that if you've been passive, maybe for the past couple of years, there's something missing inside of your heart. Maybe you've lost the joy. Maybe you're not walking into that abundant life that Jesus promised. In fact, you may even look at somebody else's life and you say, man, that's pretty good. 
I think I'd rather have that. And perhaps it's because you've forgotten your mission. You see, last week we learned that we are embraced by grace. But just like the prodigal is welcomed into the father's house, also after we experience that love, it's like we are sent out into the road like the Good Samaritan. And God uses us and designed us to be his agents of reconciliation so that perhaps we might be used to help people in restoring their wounds and their brokenness. You see, the mission of God for you and I was clear. He said it in Matthew 28. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. God has called you to fight a good fight. Like Tim mentioned earlier this morning, it's what the Apostle Paul calls the good fight of faith. Not only are we embraced by grace, but we are designed for good. And in particular, we are designed to fight a good fight. And why is it a fight? Well, because if you've ever tried to follow this mission, if you've ever tried to make disciples, <laughs> then you know it's a fight. Because not only do you have a spiritual enemy in Satan, listen, you also have your own flesh, your own stuff that you got to worry about, your sin nature. You got your family, you got issues, you got cultural pressures. And on top of that, Carlos, you're telling me that Jesus is calling us to get involved in the mess of somebody else's life? Yes. Yes. Because that's what you were designed to do. I love what Thomas Aquinas once wrote. He said, if the highest aim of a captain were to preserve his ship, he would keep it in port forever. But you weren't just designed for safety. You were designed for a good fight. That's what Polycarp understood. You see, he was 86 years old when he fought that good fight in front of that Roman governor, which means, listen, for you and I today, if you are not dead, you're not done. But how do we fight that good fight of faith? Jesus had some word for the disciples in his farewell address in John chapter 15 that are going to be of great instruction to you and I this morning. And listen, if you're here and, you know, this is your first time in church in a long time or you're just kind of kicking the tires and trying to find out what Christianity is all about, then today you're going to get a good picture of what the Christian life is about because it is about fighting a good fight of faith. Listen to what Jesus says in John chapter 15, beginning in verse 18. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Welcome to church. How do we fight the good fight of faith? Listen, if you're taking doubt notes, number one, expect opposition. Expect opposition. It's such an interesting way that Jesus begins the sentence. It looks like a conditional sentence, if the world hates you, right? But that if practically becomes a when. It's like a boxing coach um, you know, telling their fighter, if you get hit in the face today, know that I got hit in the face back in the day. Meaning what? Meaning you're going to get hit in the face. <laughs> Opposition is the necessary ingredient of a good fight. Is it not? It reminds me uh, of just about a couple of years ago, I visited this uh, pastor friend of mine in the south side of the city of Chicago, and in his office, I saw this poster that one of his mentors had given to him. And it said the following. Charlie, have the heart of a child, 
the mind of a scholar and the hide of a rhinoceros. In other words, expect opposition. Expect opposition. Listen, the Christian life is not neutral. It is a good fight. And you and I, we're going to need tough skin, spiritual armor for the battle that lies ahead. But you might be wondering, but why would the world hate us? Is it because of what we say? Well, sometimes, right? Is it because of our political affiliation, primarily because I'm a Democrat or I'm a Republican, you know, or just because I live here in, in Longmont? Well, that's not what's primary. Jesus says here in the text, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. Just a couple of verses later, he'll say, verses later, uh, verses later. English is my second language. <laughs> my goodness. But this is what Jesus said. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name. My name. The primary motivation for the opposition that you and I will experience is our association with Jesus. Growing up, my mother used to take my sister and I to school. And we'd be on this really long commute. And if she saw me hanging out with the wrong kind of crowd, she said this so many times that I remember it to this day. She would tell me this. Tell me who you're with, and I'll tell you who you are. She saw me make certain kinds of choices, suddenly get involved with the wrong crowd, and she would tell me once again, tell me who you're with, and I'll tell you who you are. In Spanish, it's a very famous saying. It goes like this. Dime con quien andas y te diré quien eres. Tell me who you're with and I'll tell you who you are. Little did I know that my mom was encapsulating not only a sociological reality, but a fundamental theological issue in the Christian faith. Listen, who you are with really determines who you are in Christ. If you are with Christ, then it means that you are a Christian. And that costs something. It costs our identity. It costs our life. We sing, I surrender my dreams, my heart, my story, because I know that God has a better plan for my life. Because I know that when I become a part of his story, then I can experience the powerful, transforming grace of God. But if I say that I'm a Christian, but I do not live like one, then you know what Jesus says to you and I today? He says, listen, if you are of the world, the world would love you as its own. Maybe you're here and you're not experiencing any kind of opposition in your life. And that's because you're not living like a Christian. And so then, of course, the question in your own mind has to be, well, have I experienced the grace of God truly? Or today, do I need to just come back and fix my eyes on Christ so that I can do what he's called me to do. Listen, if you're here and you're in business and you just kind of look the other way every time your partner makes a shady deal, of course the world's going to love you. If you're here and you just go out and party with your friends and you get drunk and uh, everything's fine, you know what, you do you, bro, and then, you know, I just do whatever I want to do, then of course the world would love you as its own. Oh my gosh, if you just have casual sex because you think that's what's cool and what's normal on every show and every movie that you watch, on everything that you read, then guess what? The world would love you as its own because Christians are different. And if you want to make a difference in the world, there has to be a difference in you and in me. Do you know why the early church grew? Because it was different from the Roman government. While Rome valued glory, Christians valued humility. While Rome let... The poor starved to death. The Christians fed them. You see, Christians made a difference by being different. Because listen, they knew that they were in for a really good fight. They expected 
opposition. Have you faced some of that in your life? The reason we need to, to know and to have that expectation in our hearts is because, listen, Jesus called us to love a world that will sometimes oppose us. You see, the, the world is not our enemy. It's our mission field. And we need to have that expectation cemented into our hearts. So listen, don't be surprised. Don't be surprised if today you make a commitment and you're going to, you know what, I'm going to fight this good fight of faith and I'm going to start reading my word. But then suddenly tonight you just, you know, you have a fight with a friend or your spouse and you're up late and then you wake up in the morning and you're exhausted. And I'm like, I can't read the Bible. I don't even understand what this says. Don't be surprised if you go to work and your co-workers have different ethical values than those that you do. Don't be surprised if at the end of church today you go out to lunch and then you go home and then you watch a movie or a TV show and it absolutely paints a different picture of reality than what the Bible paints for you. Listen, don't be surprised if you're hanging out on social media and you're looking at all of these you know, pictures that are just so amazing and everybody apparently has a wonderful life when I go to an Instagram page. I mean, it's incredible. Everybody really is just experiencing uh, unbelievable joy across the world. <laughs> Don't be surprised when you begin to compare yourself to those who you see in those feet and suddenly you feel lonely or you feel like you don't have enough resources. Expect opposition in this good fight. Number two, how do we prepare for the good fight of faith? We proclaim the gospel. Wow, Carlos, what an insight. Listen, what Jesus says is remarkable. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. There it is again. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. Jesus here puts the center, um, puts his finger on the center of the wound. There is another reason why the world hated Jesus and will, by association, hate you and I. And that's because of this word, of this fact called sin. In fact, the Apostle Paul says that the cross is folly to those who are perishing, meaning that when we proclaim the gospel to somebody else, well, guess what? Part of those good news is the bad news that we are sinners and we need a Savior. Well, how does that go over with people sometimes? How did that go over in your own life before you made a commitment to Christ? It is offensive to point out that there is a brokenness in us, that we have done things that have offended God. And the reason we talk about sin in church is not to present God as some sort of cosmic killjoy or, you know, as somebody who just wants you to live in guilt and shame. It's the opposite. It's because we want to point people to the heart of the issue. Listen, that sin really, the Bible says, enslaves your life. And Jesus Christ came to set you free. But sometimes we have a difficult time talking about sin because Christians, us, can trivialize it. And sometimes the world wants to redefine it. So if you're here and, you know, maybe you'll hear, oh, you struggle with alcohol. It must be a biological tendency. And so it's not really sin. Or let's say that, man, you're addicted today to porn. And, of course, there might be some neurological issues, but, you know, you just need to go to a counselor. It's not sin. Or, you know what, you're sleeping with people outside of the marriage. It's just, you know, it's just normal now. It's just a little bit different. You know, we still love Jesus, etc. So we have a really hard time drawing the line to the point where if we ask ourselves a question, well, what is sin? Sometimes we don't even know how to answer it. And so we proclaim these good news because, listen, at the heart of Christianity is the realization that the grace and the power of God crushed sin on the cross. You see, it was Jesus who fought that good fight of faith that you and I could not fight perfectly on our own. And then he rose. 
he rose again to validate it and still 2,000 years from that time the tomb is still empty if you're not a Christian here today you have to wrestle with that you have to wrestle with the fact that the reason it's 2018 is because Jesus Christ came the reason history accounts for itself in the way that it does today is because of Jesus Christ who was he he was a man that called us to fight a good fight of faith so we proclaim the gospel listen maybe you're here and the reason why you're not experiencing the abundant life in Christ that he designed for you to live is because you're not doing this when's the last time you shared your faith with somebody Maybe you're asking God, well, I'm just under, I don't understand why. I'm just not experiencing uh, his faith. And you look at somebody, oh, man, that looks really good over there. Maybe it's because you're not living in the way that God designed for you to live. Maybe it's because you're not doing what he's called you to do. Not only to proclaim the gospel to others, but also to proclaim the gospel to yourself. You see, this good fight is tough. And you can get discouraged. And how do we preach the gospel to ourselves when we're discouraged? I love what Crawford Loritz, this preacher, says. He says, when you get discouraged, you need to speak to yourself more than you listen to yourself. Isn't that true? And you tell yourself the gospel, the good news, because they apply to you today just as they did the very first day you met Jesus Christ. Christ saved me for a purpose. I don't have to live in shame because of who Jesus Christ made me. You can preach the gospel to yourself when you are discouraged. Even this morning, if you walked in apathetic, far away from God, you don't know what to do. You don't even know how you ended up here. You remember the good news that Christ died for you today. Today so that you would walk in power. And in victory, in a very real victory, that doesn't mean that you minimize the problems of every day. But it means that you can walk with confidence because you know that you have somebody behind you and inside of you. See, we don't only proclaim the gospel, but number three, we fight this good fight by relying on the helper. I love what Jesus says and how he ends this passage in John chapter 15. He says, but when the helper comes... Whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, that's the helper, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. The good fight of faith, of course, it begins. It begins on our knees, doesn't it? It's so counterintuitive that we would go before the Lord and we pray. And we would commit our lives to him. Listen, if you've been fighting this good fight, then you know you need help, don't you? That's kind of like what my prayers sound, what my prayers often sound like. Maybe in your life too, they sound something like this. God, you're so amazing. Help. (laughs) This is wonderful and I love my family and thank you for help. We need a helper. This certainly happened yesterday where I, um, with my family, you know, we went to visit the Rockies and somehow we got on this trail that's a one-way road, nine-mile trip all the way to like a million miles up in the air. And it was so exciting. But guess what? About every five minutes I was like, oh, help. And I'm making these twists and these turns and it's a gravel road and I'm like a city boy, you know. And that's sort of what the Christian life looks like sometimes you know we're walking with Jesus and oh my goodness that's incredible but look at this turn right here this is crazy help we need a helper and Jesus Christ said just even in the chapter before in John 14 I will ask the father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever the spirit of truth listen are you relying on the helper or are you trying to do this whole thing by yourself we need to rely on the helper if we're gonna fight the good fight of faith but listen if you're here and you never pray and you don't study the scriptures and you don't really care about church 
and you don't hang out with others, and you haven't developed meaningful relationships with other Christians, then what do you expect? What do you expect your life to look like when you're faced with opposition? So we need to rely on the helper, and he is here to help you fight this good fight of faith. So how do we fight the good fight of faith? We expect opposition. We proclaim the gospel to others and to ourselves, and we rely on the helper. So I'll leave you with this. A friend of mine a couple of years ago was telling me about his journey, uh, about running the Boston Marathon. And across that 26.2-mile journey, he encountered this iconic spot at Wellesley College called the Scream Tunnel. Anybody here ever heard of that? Yeah, the four of you that run, praise God. <laughs> so he was telling me, this is about halfway through the marathon, and he's just like getting tired in this moment. He's experiencing a moment of self-doubt, like, why did I sign up for this? Why am I running 26 miles? Suddenly your legs can all, you know, begin to cramp up, and in that moment at the Wellesley Scream Tunnel, what happens is uh, there are people holding up signs, number one, that essentially want uh, the runners to kiss them, and then number two, um, they're just screaming and encouraging those who are running the race. And so my friend was running, and he was discouraged. But in that moment, he heard a voice that said, Keep going! You can do this! And he asked me a question. He said, Carlos, do you know what my easiest mile in that whole marathon was? It was that mile by that scream tunnel. It would be a mistake to think that we fight this good fight of faith by ourselves. We run, surely, an individual journey, but God called us to run a collective race. Amen? As the church, he designed the church to be a place where we can sharpen each other, where we can encourage each other, where we can say when one of us is discouraged, when one of us is alone, when one of us is lost, when one of us feels like we can't go on anymore, we can say, you can do it. You can keep going because you have the Spirit of God inside of you. Because He called you for a purpose. Because Jesus Christ, listen, because listen, he, the very real Son of God died for you. And he's called you to this good fight. So this morning, here's what I'd love for us to do. Maybe you're here. And you can think about maybe one of those three points that I gave you. Maybe, maybe you have forgotten that you have a you have a world, you have an enemy, you have things that are going to come your way and you need to recalibrate your expectations. For some of those who are here, maybe that can look like, you know, if you're fighting or you're trying to fight this good fight of faith and you're lonely, your next step today, you know what it is? Is maybe to be vulnerable and to begin to take the next step here and go to a first step class, go to an event, try to form meaningful relationships so that you can gain that insight that you know what I'm not alone and I can do this because other people are doing it as well maybe fighting the good fight of faith for some of you means that you're gonna start to pray for your neighbors maybe you haven't shared your faith in a really long time and you have forgotten the root right what's at the heart of Christianity making disciples what is it for you this morning that God is calling you to do, just the next step. You don't have to envision what the entire journey will look like, but this morning, what is the one step that God is calling you to take? So I want us to pray about that together, and then at the end, after we sing a song together, I want to invite you that if you're here and you need prayer, for that next step, whatever it may be, listen, that you just come to the front. We're going to have some leaders here at the cross, wherever you may be. It doesn't have to be a life or death situation, but maybe today we can with one another say, keep going. You can do this because God designed for us to be able to be the church. Wouldn't that be a good thing? 
to just be the church and live the way that God designed for us to live. Would you pray with me? God, we come before you this morning, Lord, like we sang, Lord, just giving you our hearts, Lord, surrendering to you, to your will. Father, I pray for every person in this room, myself included, that you would put in our hearts what our next step this morning is, Lord. For some of us, it's going to be confessing our sin, Lord, and coming before you and saying, God, I'm sorry that I've been passive in this kingdom. There may be some here, Lord, Father, that may actually want to come to know you today, Lord, so that they can join this good fight. I pray that you would put that conviction in their hearts, that desire, so that they can experience your grace. For others, Lord, whatever that next step may be, I pray that they would come before you and give you that, Lord, and make that commitment, Father. Thank you for your son, Jesus, Lord. Thank you for the church, Lord. Thank you that we don't have to do this by ourselves. I pray today that we would walk out different from the way that we came in and that we would remember, Lord, what you have designed for us and how you designed for us to live. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.